Tonight, UTSA continues a new tradition of having an outstanding faculty member deliver their last lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce our last lecturer, Dr. Mary McNaughton Castle. Dr. McNaughton Castle received her PhD in 1991 from the University of California, San Diego. San Diego State University joint doctoral program in clinical psychology with an emphasis on behavioral medicine. She joined UTSA in 1994 and is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology in the College of Liberal and Fine Arts. A recognized authority on the subject of stress, Dr. McNaughton Castle has presented locally, regionally, and nationally. Her research has appeared in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, Journal of Applied Social Psychology, Marriage and Family Review, Anxiety, Stress, and Coping, and Journal of Media Psychology. Last year, she published a book, Mind the Gap, Coping with Stress in the Modern World, which explores the stress of modern life and how thoughts and feelings can both create and bridge the gap between what we have and what we want. At UTSA, Dr. McNaughton Castle teaches theories of learning, psychology and health, abnormal psychology and stress management and physiological psychology. She also team teaches an honors course on the science and psychology of everyday life with her husband, biology professor Aaron Castle. In her 20 years at UTSA, she has been recognized with many numerous honors, including the Ambassador's Amber Award, the Student Government Distinguished Faculty Teaching Award, the Honors College Outstanding Mentor Award, the Regents Outstanding Teaching Award, and the How Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching Award, and most recently, in 2013, with the President's Distinguished Achievement Award for University Service. She is a founding member of the University's Academy of Distinguished Teaching Scholars. Of her role as a member of the UTSA faculty, Dr. McNaughton Castle says, teaching is my job, my avocation, and my passion. My goal as a teacher is not to use the classroom as a place to show what I know, but rather as a venue to help students figure out how to learn what they need to know to achieve both their personal and professional dreams. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary McNaughton Castle. It is an honor to give this lecture. I actually kind of laughed because some of you were here for my husband Aaron's first last lecture, which at least has a ring to it. The second last lecture kind of sounds like a, a leftover talk, doesn't it? But I was happy to have the chance and actually happy because I got to see him do it first, so it's not as unusual or a new unfamiliar setting for me. See, it's not just me, you guys. I, I bring a jinx when I touch technology. But what I want to talk about today is uh, a subject I entitle Lifetime Guarantee Not Included. Now, I do a lot of lectures at different venues. When I talk at graduations and award ceremonies, I always try to kind of memorize my talk and have it laid out. But I thought that since this is called a lecture, I'm going to do it the same way I do in class. I've blocked it out on my PowerPoints, and I'm just going to talk. And I am OK if somebody wants to raise their hand and say something, too, since that's the way I like my classes to run. The trick with giving these sorts of lectures, though, is to try to weave in what you know in your work, in your literature searches, in your research, with what you really think, so that it comes across as giving people something to think about. And that's going to be my goal. Now let's see if this works. Yes. Do have to give you sort of a caveat. This is not my eye, but this is how my eyes have been looking. Me and Bob Costas had conjunctivitis last week. Don't ask me how I managed to do that in the middle of the Olympics. But the reason I'm telling you this is because I don't want to shake anybody's hands tonight. According to the doctor, I am no longer contagious, but I'm not sure I trust them. And this was not fun. So we will, we will skip on that. Let me get going. So when we think about why we're alive and what living is about, the real idea at the baseline is survival. Do you have enough food? Do you have enough water? Do you have a stable temperature, which has been kind of uh, difficult to achieve here in San Antonio the last <laughs> few months? Do you have security? In psychology, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy, that triangle where you start at the base with things that you have to do to survive. 
And then as you get more comfortable in your life, you can worry about how socially connected you are, how well you're getting along with people, whether you're really achieving your dreams and your goals. The difference between humans and others, though, is that we have been able to pool our resources, to use our social nature to become better at this survival game than just about any other species. Part of this, we believe in psychology and also biology, is because the brain of humans has become specialized in things that promote social connection. We have language. That is something that we know other animals can mimic in terms of communication, but none of them have developed the facility we have to use language to communicate not only with people in real time, but also across time to be able to write things down that people can see and learn generation to generation. In addition, we have emotional sensitivity. We have abstract reasoning. We can think about things in ways that go well beyond the concrete factors in our lives. It's not just what we see, but it's what we can imagine. And that changes our experiences as well. The funny thing about teaching psychology and talking about the brain so much is that most of us know very little about our own brain. A lot of you have had me in class, you've heard me go on this rant before. When you were in middle school and high school, how many classes did you have on how your brain works? Maybe one or two? How many classes did you have on geology, on the moon, the tides, basic science? You know, I watched my kids go through that, and they cycled through the basic science areas, which are important, but I keep on arguing that we need to talk a lot more about how the brain works because that is really the basis of how we see the world, how we perceive it. The students who take our class, the one that Erin and I co-teach, the science and psychology of everyday life, know that we spend a whole unit on how your brain makes sense of the world, how it processes information, puts it together, brings in memory, and most of us haven't spent a lot of time talking about that. Consequently, I am going to force you to at least look at a picture of a neuron. You might all be <laughs> saying, no, no. The colored pictures, which will show up better if you can see the slides, are actually stained neurons. These are networks of actual neurons in a brain. The diagram at the top is the one we always put in the psych and the bio books about what a neuron looks like. It's a regular cell. It's a typical cell like you would have anywhere in your body that would have a membrane, would have internal components so it could replicate. But it has a feature that other cells don't have and that's the ability to communicate. Neurons have this long projection called the axon, which carries information. And they have all of these branches off the body called dendrites that receive information. Now there are millions, probably billions, of neurons in your brain and your central nervous system. In your brain, they're packed in so small that we really couldn't see them very well until we got better electron microscopes. However, the longest neuron in your body stretches all the way from the base of your spinal cord out to your big toe. And as I joke in my physio psych class, for people like Tim Duncan, that's a long neuron, huh? <laughs> Carrying the information, there are also neurons that carry sensory information. I can see a few people here kind of cringing, like now she's going to ask us about do we remember the synapse and myelin. I won't do that to you. But I do wish that we knew a little bit more about not only how those messages are conveyed, but how they're organized. Now here's the other trick to the nervous system. The chemical signals in our brain enable neurons to talk to each other. Without going into great detail, the signal within an axon is electrical, but the signal between neurons is chemical. That gives your nervous system a whole lot of flexibility. These are just some of the neurotransmitters, the chemicals that we've identified. Some of them you know about. Some of them maybe you didn't know you knew about them, but if you know somebody who's depressed and is taking an antidepressant, the odds are really good that they are taking an SSRI, Prozac, one of those substances. SSRI stands for Serotonin Selective Reuptake Inhibitor. What it does is it blocks serotonin. It makes it stay active in your nervous system longer. So people who are depressed 
feel better when they have longer serotonin activity. If you like chocolate, if you like sports, if you like music, if you like substances like alcohol, then you have actually been activating your dopamine system. We call dopamine the reinforcement transmitter. It is activated in anything that's psychoactive, so any substance that has an addictive property, but basically anything that's reinforcing. GABA, some of you recognize it, some don't. GABA is a substance that is inhibitory in your brain and your nervous system. Fortuitously, there are a number of substances that humans like to use that have a structure that's very like GABA. Alcohol, barbiturates, anti-anxiety meds. Now this is an inhibitory transmitter, so what is one of the unfortunate combinations that pops up in the news every three or four months when some celebrity takes a combination of those drugs and what happens? Pass away, it inhibits their breathing because GABA is inhibitory and when you take those substances in combination, they have a synergistic effect. Affects the heart, affects breathing. There are other things here we could talk about. The endorphins are involved in pain. But the reason I'm bringing these up is to give you sort of a sense of the complexity of the responses that your brain and your nervous system have. The ability they have to respond to the environment, to process that information, and then to impact the environment. One of the ironies is that we have not yet been able to create a computer that can come anywhere near organizing and managing and processing information the way the human brain does. Part of that has to do with the way the brain is organized. I know you can't really see the tiniest pictures here, but these are relative comparisons of the sizes of the brain. The human brain is not the biggest brain out there. Elephants have a bigger brain than we do. Obviously, animals that are larger than us can have a larger brain. But we have a, what we do have is the most complicated brain. The cortex is that convoluted mass. You can see as you go across different animal species that our brain gets more and more dense. They estimate that if you took that cortex out of your skull and opened it up, the cells would be about the size of a pillowcase spread out, but they're crumpled up like a piece of paper. We have more cells packed in that gives us way more opportunity to process information. Now I can assure you that my husband is laughing as he looks at this picture because we have a rabbit, we have cats, we have a dog, and he's always commenting on their lack of brain cells. And there is a certain truth to that as you look at ours. However, even rats, cats, rabbits have parts of their brain that are very similar to ours. Those internal things, the things that re regulate breathing, heart rate, those are going to be the same. It's these cortical functions that make us different. Again, as I would say in class, I'm not going to give you a quiz on this. I do wish the brain was actually color coordinated. It would make it so much easier. It's not, but I like to think of it in terms of color coordination. What this shows is some of the major divisions of the cortex. As you're looking at it, you see there's an area that specializes in vision. You can have damage to this back occipital lobe of your brain and not be able to decode what you see, even if your eyes are fine. You can't make sense of what you see. The parietal lobe, those colored areas up at the top, the sensory and the motor cortex, control movement and sensation. What's very interesting about them is they are coded in terms of how sensitive your body is, not in terms of how big a body part is. So there is more space in the sensory part of your cortex devoted to your hands and your tongue and your mouth and your lips than to your entire back. That's why a paper cut on your finger can drive you absolutely nuts. And a scrape on your back, not so much. We don't always think about it like that. We say, well, my fingers are more sensitive. But of course, this is part of our human social ability. Why do we need a really sensitive mouth and tongue and lips? To talk. The reason chimps and apes can't speak like we do is not because they can't learn some language. We've shown with sign language that they can. But what they can't do is make the sounds we make. The only animals that have the vocal apparatus to make the sounds that we do 
are the birds in the parrot kind of class, and so they can make those sounds. But it has a lot to do with how much cortex is devoted to those structures to control them. Obviously, the temporal lobes, language and hearing, crucial areas because our language is so complex, but mediated by the frontal areas where thinking, planning, goal setting, abstract reasoning, all of those things are happening. When you look at a teenager and say, what were you thinking? Or when your parents say that to you, <laughs> remind them that this frontal part of your brain is probably not done developing until your 20s. MRI studies of brains now show that teens' brains don't solve problems the same way that older folks do. So the bottom line is they were thinking differently. It might not have been thinking well, but it is a function of how their brain is organized. What this is saying then is that not only do we take in the sensory, visual, and auditory information, but we process it, we organize it, we think about it, and that gives us capabilities that lots of other animals over time haven't had. We can think a lot about the future. We can remember and dwell on the past. We can reframe things, basically rewrite the story sometimes because we can focus on some parts of our experience and ignore others. There's a book I always recommend by a guy named Sapolsky that's called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Anybody read that? I see Lauren's shaking her head, Laurel. Um, zebras, why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers is, says that zebras get stressed in the moment when there's something you can do about it. And after the event is over, they let it go. But what do you do when you get stressed? Worry about it that night, worry about it the next day, talk to people, worry about it some more, get, get worked up. So Polsky's point is that we can have a whole set of experiences in our head that never happen. But as far as our body, our fight or flight responses, our stress goes, our body responds as though it could have happened or it might happen or it might be happening. And that creates layers of stress that animals and other um, species don't have. Now we've managed to complicate that even more by using our social skills to develop technology. Humans have developed all of the technology and modern conveniences that we have because we can communicate by language. We don't have to start over figuring algebra out ourselves each time. We teach our kids how to do it so they can build on that. And in fact, there's an interesting line of research looking at why humans are the only species we know of that actively teaches their young. That does not mean other species don't demonstrate. You can watch a mother kitten act like she's hunting and have the babies follow her. But humans will take your hand and show you how to do something. We use language to teach. We use our social skills to teach. And that lets us go forward with innovation. It also means that our lives have gotten unbelievably more complicated. Our brains, which have evolved to work in a small social group to promote survival among ourselves, suddenly have Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and all these other ways of connecting with people, which are creating choices, contacts, information, and often a real sense of being overwhelmed or overloaded by that information. I don't know if you can see this cartoon. I quite enjoyed it. He said, I hit the control key. Why am I not in control? You know, in my stress management class, I ask students to spend a week finding out what their grandparents and their great-grandparents did for a living. Some of them know. Some of them have to go back and ask. But then we compare what they say about stress to what they feel about stress in their own lives. So they look at where their family was. Inevitably, they find out that their family members have much harder lives. They worked more. Uh, physically, people died of illnesses that we've cured today, but they didn't necessarily report having higher stress. Some of the aspects of modern life, like our sedentary lifestyle, the disruptions in our sleep from electricity, our diet, pressure of deadlines, pressure of expectations, all of those things are new and different in the modern world and have created a new set of stresses that we're not always ready to deal with. Now, this is a picture of my mom. 
This was taken in 1950, I don't know what, 56. She's in her 80s now. I asked her, how come you became a nurse? Why did you decide to be a nurse? She said, because in 1950, whatever, women became nurses or teachers. And nurses worked and lived at the hospital and they got paid for doing it. So I could get trained and I could get paid and so that's what I did. Can you imagine nurses wearing this on the ward now? She still has those white hats. They gave them to you when you graduated. It was a real big deal. But one of the funny things about not having so many choices is you don't have a lot of time to second guess what you chose. There isn't a lot of time to say, oh, I should have done something else. Maybe I could have been happier in this other field. Maybe I needed a job that was more prestigious or made more money. Today, what I see a lot among college students is just this overwhelmed, frozen state. There's so many majors, so many careers, so many job choices that they can't decide at all. And so they stall out. Some of you are nodding. I've seen, I've talked to some of you about <laughs> this stall out. The problem is that the more expectations you have, the more opportunities there are to fail, to get frustrated. That's what my book was about. And people are always laughing and saying, well, what the heck is that title? Thing, the story is that I've always described stress as the gap between what you have and what you want. And I was thinking about this book when I was at a conference in England. And when you get on their subway, instead of saying, watch your step, it says, mind the gap. And that became a really good way for me to think about managing stress. The gap is what you, the, the, the difference between what you have and what you want. And the real place you're going to be able to mind that is in your brain, in your mind, in the way that you frame the world. Now, I have not written a single word on the sequel to this book, but I did find the title not long ago. We were in Jamaica on a, a cruise, and I saw one of their yield signs, and it doesn't say yield when you're driving. It says give way. So this book was really on personal stress. My next one's going to be on social stress, but I think I'm going to call it give way and see how I can work that in to the topic. Now, one of the folks that I have really been influenced by and like the research of is an, a gentleman named Stephen Hobfall. He is in uh, Chicago now. He was at Kent State. He actually came out here and spoke once through the MBRS program. He framed a theory of stress that I really like. It's called the conservation of resources model of stress. The idea behind it is that stress is the loss of something. Now, that something can vary. We think often in terms of objects, material goods, money, cars, houses. But he said it could be conditions. Getting divorced doesn't just mean that you no longer live in the house with the same house with the same people, but it also means that you've lost status, a position. When, my, when I talk to people in my private practice who are getting divorced, they say things like, I don't know how to be single. I haven't done this in a long time. I've been part of a couple for so long I can't adjust. When people lose jobs, they say the same sorts of things. When people lose skills, when you have a head injury or a physical injury and you can no longer do something you used to like to do, you might, might experience this kind of loss of a condition. He wrapped time and money in. His theory is pretty complicated. So you can talk about whether social support is positive or negative. Also, he talked about whether the stress is real, as in you actually had the loss, or is it just that you're worried about it? If you've ever been around somebody who worked at a company where they were having layoffs, you don't have to be laid off to be stressed, right? You can be stressed just thinking about getting laid off. So that is part of what Hobfall looked at. But what I would argue is that in the modern life, with our complicated cortex, we can worry about these things a lot. Whether or not we are actually at risk of losing them, we can anticipate that stress. And of course, as much as we want to protect ourselves, we're really all just one disaster away from losing some or all of these resources. I don't think you can see it in this picture. I will post these PowerPoints if you want. I took this picture in Moore, Oklahoma last summer. I went up with a disaster response team. I do some work with psychological disaster response. We were working in one of the shelters in Moore. The reason I took it, and what you can't see is this house is gone, but the barbecue is standing there on the patio like nothing happened. 
It is perfectly <laughs> situated on the patio. The rest of the neighborhood is gone. We were working in a shelter through Oklahoma's um, Department of Mental Health and talking to people who had gone to work that morning. The tornado came up. It happened very rapidly. A lot of them couldn't get home in time because Moore is a suburb of Oklahoma City, so their kids were in school, but they were in the city. And they got home to this kind of scene if they even could get back on their street. Working in that shelter, I, wa I talked to a seven-year-old little boy who'd been in one of the two schools that was destroyed. And I asked him how he felt about living through this and losing his house. And he looked at me like a seven-year-old can, and he said, oh, I've got a plan now. And I said, oh, what's your plan? He said, when I grow up, I'm going to build houses, and they're going to have five walls, and inside, and another, and another, and another, and another. <laughs> and then that tornado can't get all my walls. <laughs> and I said, good plan. I also talked to a paramedic whose best friend had died at one of those schools. And there isn't much you can say to somebody about it. You certainly can't say, oh, you'll get over it or you'll forget. What we ended up doing is having a conversation about how he could honor his memory, what he could do to go forward. But anytime any of us see these kinds of pictures with our powers of um, abstract reasoning, we also start thinking, well, what would we do? How would we feel? So Polsky's point is that other animals like zebras don't do that. Either they're threatened or they're not, and they go on. Now, of course, the largest gap of all is the fact that we are all going to die. And we know this, and of course, this being the last lecture, you were expecting me to work it in there somewhere, right? <laughs> but it's actually something that I work into all my classes. Both psych and health and stress management, the textbooks do not have a chapter on death and dying. Mine does, because I put it in there. You know, you can talk a lot about stress and coping, but if you pretend we're not going to die, you're not dealing with one of the largest gaps we experience, which is knowing that the things we love and have in our lives aren't going to last forever. Now, there are a whole bunch of traditions for trying to make sense of this gap. Whether you're a philosophy major, a religious studies major, whether you have you know, engaged in art, literature, music, entertainment, humans have that ability to think about this gap. But what I find odd about modern life is that we like to think about it at a distance. We all loved the bucket list. I don't think you'd like it as much if one of your relatives came up and said, well, I've only got six months to live, here's my bucket list. It would be a little bit different when it happened in real life. And that's where the human ability to deny things can sometimes lead us astray. As much as we don't want to anticipate or think about this, we do have the ability to think forward and process that idea. The irony is that most of us don't have to deal with death on a daily basis, so it's a pretty foreign idea. This is my dad. I think this picture was taken maybe 1936, 1937. He was probably four or five years old. Grew up in a very small town in northern Maine, height of the Depression. You know, here in our world, we get squeamish if we have to hear about how the chickens are raised. We're not used to killing or raising our own food. We don't have people die at home. People die in the hospital. We shelter kids from things. My dad was helping to hunt and get food to eat as soon as he could walk. And I can guarantee you, this is not a picture of what they did on their vacation. This is a picture of what they were having for dinner. He lived with his parents, his grandparents, a couple aunts and uncles, and they um, hunted fish, did guiding, that sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying we all want to go back to the basics, but I think if you have raised your own food, if you've had to hunt, you probably have a different sense of death and dying than what most of us have, which comes from the media, it comes from the internet, it comes from games. This is something my students will also recommend. It drives me nuts. Some of you already heard me do this. I'm showing a video. And they'll show some neurosurgeon and he's isolating part of the brain. Or a baby's being born. Or someone's injured and the whole class is going, eh. And then I stand up and I go, how many of you watch Dexter? How many of you love Criminal Minds? How many of you told me you want to do forensic psych? You cannot deal with death from an entertainment point of view and do those careers. You're going to have to get away from looking at the hero and talk about how messy 
It really is. And that's the part we haven't seen in modern life. Television shows, games, they don't really show the reality of its, what it's like to be around. For most of us, the first time we experience somebody dead is a pet. And that's a pretty traumatic experience for many kids. Oftentimes, even with pets, parents try to hide it from them. Oftentimes, when a family member dies, they say, oh, let's not take the kids to the funeral. They're too young. What happens then is we've got all these mediated versions of death and dying, no reality, no actual picture. And if you had to watch your family plan a funeral, typically happens when it's somebody you're close to. So the first time you're dealing with a funeral is a close relative, you're emotionally upset, and you've never even been to a funeral, and you don't know how to plan it. It's kind of like if I said plan a wedding, but you've never seen a wedding. And yet we don't seem to see a disconnect here. Even 50 or 100 years ago, there wasn't that disconnect. People died at home. People had the wake or whatever the mourning was at home. They had things at the church where they were. This is a story that creeps my classes out again, but I'll tell it anyway. In Greenville, Maine, the 40 mile lake freezes solid every winter. You can drive out on it if you want to. Ever think about what you do when people die in the winter in a place that's that frozen? I know you didn't, because we're in Texas. The mortuaries there have vaults where they save people. When my aunt died in February, they literally keep you on ice till summer when you can bury them in the cemetery in town. And everyone goes, ah, oh. but that's a reality. That was a reality of what it was like when my dad was going up in Greenville, Maine. For us, it actually worked out because we could all be there when they did it, but it's not the kind of thing we're used to thinking about. And we're not used to talking about it either. We don't talk about death and dying in real terms. We don't talk about it to the people who matter. Some of us have parents who are older and we're starting to, but of course, just because your parents are older doesn't mean that that's when they're gonna die. We don't have guarantees on these things. And we often don't wanna talk to the people around us who are experiencing death or dying. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us feel awkward. It makes us feel like we don't know what to say and we're maybe gonna make it worse. And the problem is when people are going through grief, they know you're not gonna fix it. They know you're not gonna tell them something that's gonna make it better. But what makes it worse is pretending they're not going through it, not acknowledging it, not helping them. Last summer, one of um, my more powerful UTSA moments happened. There was a student here at UTSA, I'm pretty sure most of you won't remember her, but her name was Sandra Kane. She was an older student who came back to college after her husband finished his military service. She went through our undergraduate program. She was an officer in the student psych club. She went on to go into the graduate program in counseling here at UTSA, and then she was diagnosed with lung cancer. There were nine months between when she was diagnosed and she passed away last July. The last time I saw her was about three weeks before she died. I was going over to her house to visit her every couple of weeks. It was that morning, some of you will remember this morning last summer where there was that huge thunderstorm, just buckets of rain in the middle of the day. So I was at her house for about two hours. And I said, what can I do for you? I know, you know, we're kind of at the end of the line here. And she said, well, can I just talk? Because I can't talk to my daughter. She's so upset. I don't want to make her feel worse. My husband's on the edge of coping. And so we talked for about two hours about how she felt. And when I said goodbye to her, that was the first time in my life that I have actually said goodbye to someone where I knew for sure I wasn't going to see her again because her husband was taking her up to her daughter's house in Dallas and they were going to have her in hospice. And so it was the last time I saw her. But it was one of the most moving conversations I've had. And uh, what struck me the most was her grace. She wasn't saying, I don't want to die, or why am I dying, or how can I punish the people around me because they couldn't keep me from dying. She was really trying to make sense of it. And I think that that's what we need to start realizing, is there isn't a right thing to say. There isn't a way to fix it. But people do want us to acknowledge it. They know we're thinking about it. We know they're thinking about it. Sometimes deaths are harder to assimilate than others. Certainly if they're unexpected, like an accident. Of course, this is a picture of the shooting back in Connecticut. That one hit almost all of the reasons that it is hard for people to cope with. Interestingly, from a psych point of view, we will deal better with a death that happens because of something from nature 
than something that we perceive as being human caused. So Hurricane Katrina, nobody thought they could stop the hurricane. However, what incensed people was that the levees failed and they didn't use the buses to get people out. Because that part of it seemed like something we could do. We could have changed that. We couldn't have changed the hurricane. But as we're looking at these things and how we talk about them, we often will look at these kinds of things, a suicide, a homicide, and say, well, it's unfair and it's terrible, but I'll make it worse if I talk to them, so I just won't. And the truth is it's better for all of us if we do talk about it. Now, there are people who deal with death for a living, and I'm sure it was easier for me to talk to Sandy and it's easier for me to talk to people in my private practice because I've been doing this for a while. This is a picture of the shelter that I was working at after Hurricane Ike down in Galveston. Went down there with the Red Cross to do some mental health work. And again, looking at people who have lost everything and are still resilient. I remember one family, it was a mom and about six kids, and she'd set up their cots in a little square in the shelter, and she had taken some crates and put them right side up. And I forget, some charity had given them stuffed animals, and they had all taken those animals, and she'd put one on each bed so that it would kind of look like a bedroom. And one of the things we strive for under stress is normality. And in fact, that's one of the things we talk about giving people when you're doing this disaster kind of work, is a sense of normality. Give them something to do again. Get them anchored. Help them to figure out what they're going to do next. Because in the midst of losing all those resources, humans are pretty resilient. They want to have hope. They want to use that forward thinking to figure out a way out of the mess, to go forward. And that brings me around to talking about this idea that we have more control of how we think about the world than we actually realize. People will tell me, I can't help how I think, I can't help how I feel. And I'll say, you can't help what happens in the world. That's true. But your responses, the story you tell about it, the way you manage it, the choices you make, those are the things that you can help. Again, students who've had my classes have seen this diamond. Some of them are probably going, I don't want to see it again. But <laughs> if you want a way to think about how you're coping, how you're managing stress, how you think about the things that make you anxious or scared or nerve-wracking, this is a way to do it. These are the four ways that you can experience stress. There are also four things that can cause stress. And what we do in stress management class, which is actually kind of a neat exercise, is people keep a journal for a week of the things that stress them out. They write down the event, and then they write down, what was I thinking? What was I feeling? What did I do? And then they start to analyze whether there are patterns. Now, this comes from a field called cognitive behavioral psychology, CBT. It's the idea that the way you think can be rational, it can be irrational. This is the story. I give a test last week. I can guarantee you after every test that there will be a different range of emotions in my office. Some people get a C. And they come in and they're ecstatic. You've been there, right? You didn't read, you were frantic, you thought you failed, you passed. And then there were people who got to see and they come in and cry. I need to go to grad school, I need to go to med school, I studied, I don't know what went wrong. And what I say is, you know, a C is a C. It's how you think about it that matters. Irrational thinking about something bad falls in the category of this is terrible, it's unfair, it just shows I'm too stupid, I'm never going to get better, everything's going to be bad going forward. And if that's the way you think about events, then that certainly is reasonable to feel bad. If you come in and tell me you want to do better on the test, and I say, okay, so you didn't do well on that test. Did you read the book? Did you buy the book? Have you been to class? <laughs> Have you? Did you come to my office hours? All right, let's think our way through how you could do this better next time. Let's calculate your points. Let's see where you need to go. Usually I can get people to leave my office with a sense of hope instead of a sense of despair, but it has to do with how they're thinking. Sometimes the way we leave is not, you're maybe going to do better in this class, but, and I'm sorry, I see Dr. Jordan and Aaron both here, I have said to biology majors in particular, Maybe you should rethink your major. Maybe the fact that you're not even getting C's in whatever major, but often bio folks are coming over to psych, 
means that's not your passion. That's not what you're good at. That isn't where you should be. That doesn't mean you're stupid. Doesn't mean you're failing. Doesn't mean you're going to have to give up on your whole life and all those sorts of things. Now, the problem between thoughts and feelings is they use two parts of the brain. The emotional part of your brain is deep inside. It's called the limbic system. Your limbic system doesn't look very different than your cats or your pet rats or rabbits. It is there to respond quickly under duress, under stress. It is there to force you to fight or flee or do something to survive. In the modern world, with all these stresses that we're experiencing, you have the same fight or flight response whether you're mad at your boss or you're being threatened by a tiger. And that emotional response is very strong. It will swamp thought unless you consciously back up and think about those irrational beliefs and ways to reframe them. Now, this is a simplification of how irrational beliefs work, but I tend to think in terms of three different categories. So you can think about this a minute. Think about the last thing that stressed you out, whether it was traffic, parking, a grade, a phone call, whatever. And think now, did you take that event and start projecting bad things forward? Catastrophizing, I'm going to be late, I'm never going to make it, this is terrible, things are going to be horrible, people are going to be mad at me. If you're a catastrophizer, if you tend to take things and worry a lot about future ramifications, the odds are that it is that your go-to emotion is anxiety. If you worried more about approval and social connection and what would people think and how bad is this going to look, then you probably got depressed. And if you worried more about fairness or unfairness or justice or blame, you probably got angry. I did a survey after 911 looking at people's responses, and sure enough, we started kidding about it. I use it now to remember. People were either sad, they were mad, or they thought it was really bad. Depression, anger, and anxiety. Your brain is wired to do those, but our world doesn't fit in quite as easily as the wiring was wired for on the savannah. Part of the problem is that originally stress was typically acute. The tiger either ate you or you got away. Today, it's chronic. You know, running from the tiger gives you something to do. Hitting your boss might feel like a good response, but it's going to cause longer, prob longer range problems. So as we look at the physiological part of that diamond, we see that stress and arousal can actually have some negative consequences on your body. The catch is we don't always pay attention to these things, especially in the modern world. How many times have you been exhausted, stressed, sick, tired, and said, well, I'll just push through. I'll just do it again. I can make it. And then gotten more sick. And uh, some of you can laugh about me, too, but we'll, <laughs> we'll pass that right now. The thoughts, the feelings, the physiology, they give you clues about behavior, the choices you make. I really like these little mice. I found them online. But the idea is that you can't change the events that happen in your world. But if you pay attention to your thoughts and your feelings and your body, you can change your choices. Whether you are worrying about a grade, worrying about, worrying about someone in your family who's sick, or worrying about your own future, whether you're going to get into grad school or law school or whatever it is you're thinking about. Now, there's a book that kind of summarizes this well that I love. I did not write this book. I wish I did. It's called Rapid Relief from Emotional Distress by Emery and Campbell. They have this little formula. It's kind of embedded deep in the book. It is one of my favorite formulas, though. It's called the ACT formula. And what they say is there's three ways that you can get control of those thoughts and feelings. The first step is to accept reality. And I put this little if only up here because I want you to think. How many times have you been stressed and what you spent most of your time doing is thinking, if only I'd left sooner, if only my boyfriend would change, if only my parents weren't so traditional, if only I had more money, if only the test was easier, if only I had more time, whatever. We spend a ton of time on if onlys. What they say in Rapid Relief from Emotional Distress is, Focus on what is true. You're late. You didn't leave in time. You didn't do well on this test. Your parents aren't going to change at their age. So given that reality, what are you going to create a vision? How are you going to go forward? What are you going to do? Their argument, which I agree with, with, is that taking action is actually quite easy. 
once you've gotten through A and C, but it's hard to get through A and C. A lot of people get hung up on those. When you do marital therapy, this is what happens. Couples come in and they spend a ton of time telling you what's wrong with the other person. They'll do that for weeks if you let them. And then you say, well, what do you want him to do? What would he have to do to make you happy? And sometimes they can't even tell you. Well, I know what I don't want him to do. OK, what do you want him to do? That's a little bit harder to get to. And that brings me to probably the last of my personal stories here. I always talk about this incident because it's easy to look at the person who's lecturing and say, yeah, well, you know, they study this, they do research, they train as a therapist, but they don't really have to do it in their life. They haven't dealt with these things. Probably the biggest stressor that's happened in my personal life happened in 2006, and then it cropped up again in 2009. Both times, I started getting a little bit of numbness and tingling in my fingers. And I thought it was carpal tunnel. I really did, and so did my doctor. And I went on a tour of doctors getting tested, and they kept calling it atypical carpal tunnel syndrome. Thank goodness my doctor was not happy with that diagnosis. So she sent me to a neurologist, and the MRI showed that I have something called cervical spinal stenosis. I'd never heard of this before. What it means is that my spinal cord is too skinny. And as I got older and my discs started to shift and bulge, they were putting pressure on my spinal cord with the result that spinal fluid was building up in my neck. Now, they don't tell you this is something you're going to die from. No, what they tell you is this is something that's going to paralyze you. And I remember looking at the doctor and thinking, no, I actually blurted it out the first time. I, I can't have surgery. We have tickets to go skiing. And he was kind of <laughs> laughing, like, you're not going skiing. As it turns out, I find out that my mom's uncle, her father's brother, had this condition back in the 40s and 50s and actually died of it because they didn't have the treatment then. What was lucky for me is I had surgery in 06 and again in 09, and I now have what my daughters call a bionic neck. I have pins from C3 to C8 in typical surgeon style. If you look closely, you can see the scar here on my neck. You know what the surgeon said? I'll just put that scar in your wrinkle. It won't show so badly. <laughs> All righty then. So I actually spent my 50th birthday in a neck brace. Aaron will attest to the fact that I didn't necessarily take this with grace originally. I was pretty stressed, pretty upset, didn't fit in with my plan or my lifestyle. And then somewhere along the way, I thought, you know what? I can talk the ACT formula. I better start living it. What is the reality? So I read up on it. I figured out what I needed to do. I actually went to the gym the night before my surgery just to prove that I could still do a push-up before I had to get the surgery. I walked the night after. As soon as they let me get out of the bed, I did that. The good news, the really good news, is I was young for this surgery, but I also stayed really active. You got to look at this carefully. This is Bryce Canyon. This is June. I had surgery in January. I still have the neck brace on, right? Now, my daughters were jumping off the bench, and I was jealous, so I decided I would stand and do something. But part of the reason that this hit me so badly is because I had done gymnastics in college. I've been skiing since I was seven. I did gymnastics for about 10 years. I still go to an adult gymnastics class, which is something I love. And the thought that I wasn't going to be able to do this or that I was going to run the risk of having to really limit my physical activity was very hard for me to take. Now, I don't mean to say that I'm going to be able to do gymnastics forever. I know that I'm not going to be able to do the same things I've done. But I was at the gym one afternoon, and I heard this song, which some of you are familiar with. If you're not, you might want to look up the lyrics. I really like it. And the point was, maybe I won't be able to do gymnastics forever. Also, we're not going to live forever. Also, we're not going to achieve everything we thought we were going to achieve. But that isn't a reason to keep trying it to try to do it anyway and see what happens. I love these two people. I've never met either of them, but I bring them into my lectures. Lou Batori is now 102 years old. He belongs to a ski club in New England called the 70 Plus Ski Club. Oldest person we know who is still ski racing. Of course, he is in, <laughs> there's no one in his age category, but he's still, <laughs> still racing. <laughs> 
friend, Johanna Quas, uh, one of my friends saw her last summer in Germany, 86 years old, still doing gymnastics. Obviously, they're not doing these exactly the same way they did when they were young, but the point I'm trying to make here is that you can think about what you can't do, you can use your brain to get yourself all wound up about the things you've lost as you age, as things change, or you can keep thinking about the things you want to do going forward and how to do them and how you can adapt to them. Now, of course, not everything will succeed. This is a quote from Winston Churchill. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. That's a big thing. We don't talk about that enough in our culture because we are so focused on the winners. Did that drive you nuts the last couple weeks watching the Olympics? They make a big deal if somebody doesn't get one of the top three medals. I'm like, they're the best in the world. They got to the Olympics. It's still a good deal. I would take 24th in the world, wouldn't you? you know? <laughs> I wouldn't be going, ah, gee. But <laughs> the point is that we have to you combat the way our brain works to face the possibility of failure, of disaster, of things changing with humor and with hope. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember where Hurricane Irene was, but I always like these kind of things where they make a play on it. You know, okay, you can come through, but we're still going to laugh at you and use a song lyric for this because the idea is that they're not giving up and they're not falling prey to that idea that you have to give up because things are hopeless just because you can imagine a negative outcome happening. So to bring this all circle, I'm not quite sure when I started. I know it's time to finish. But the ACT formula applies to almost anything. We have to get better at accepting our mortality. We have to think about that and not just pretend it's not happening. We have to create a vision of how we're going to live even with things happening. We need to take action. We need to pay attention to what we can do. I am now looking in the back row at my vets who have trouble with this let others help them part of this talk. But I talk a lot to people about letting folks help you apply this ACT formula and continuing to do the things that you want to do. Now, my daughters can't be here tonight. One is at UT Austin. The other is at study abroad in England. But I'm dedicating this slide to them since I said we need to talk about death. I'm telling them right now, they all have to watch this on YouTube, that I want them to play this song at my funeral when I die. If you haven't seen it, if you don't know the words, go on YouTube. Of course, I remember Neil Diamond when he looked more like that. <laughs> this is how he looks more. I looked him up this afternoon. He's like 74. But he is still singing, still making music on things that are really interesting and important. And that's the kind of thing that I hope all of us continue to do forward. So with that said, I'm going to conclude and say there aren't any lifetime guarantees. I have never done this before, combined a talk and a gymnastics routine, but we will see if I can do this. Thank you. Thank you.